Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's CHXD webinar, When Children Are Patients, Listening to and Advocating for Voices Not Often Heard. My name is Katherine Houghton, and I am the Director of MADPOW's Center for Health Experience Design, and I am glad you're able to carve out an hour of your day to listen to the work we've been doing with children and children's hospitals. So just want to do a slide about who we are. So as I said, I'm the director for Madhouse Center for Health Experience Design, and that is a community of more than 600. We're actually almost up to 800 professionals and a range of organizations in the health space. Our partners include fledgling startups and global organizations. And MADPOW is a leverage of strategic design and the psychology of motivation to create innovative experiences and compelling digital solutions that are good for people and good for business. For this webinar, we're using GoToWebinar, um, and we will be presenting about 45 minutes, and then we'll spend 15 minutes answering your questions. So if you look onto the control panel, you see a box that says questions. Type any question you might have in there into the box, and we will try to get them at the end. Um, if you run out of time or there's something that occurs to you later, please feel to email us directly, and our contact information will show up again later. So let me hand this over to Jonathan Podolsky, our presenter. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate it. So hi, everybody. Appreciate the time uh, to talk about this important uh, topic. This is um, uh, when children are patients, listening to and advocating for voices not often heard. Uh, my name is John Podolsky. I am the Senior Vice President of Experience Strategy and Service Design here at MADPOW. Uh, my, and, um, well, let, let, let me tell you a little bit about my background uh, and why this is an important topic for me um, in, in relation to the, discu the discussion we're going to have here today. I actually started my career as an architect um, about 15 or so years ago, uh, designing the, the physical spaces that people um, would uh, interact with, some of those being healthcare or, or public spaces, but really... Um, for me, the passion was more about uh, what happens within the space, not so much the, the building of the walls or the structure itself. So um, really when service design became uh, a, a thing, uh, uh, started rather fledgling about um, 12 years ago or so, I transitioned over as, to a service designer um, as an individual who could really design what happens within, within the space, what's it like to interact with a physician or with a uh, specific touch point or going through the flow or procedures within an overall space, still focused certainly in the, the healthcare realm. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, I became a, a clinical process consultant uh, working with individual hospitals and individual departments to uh, find ways of improving patient experience or ways of, of uh, improving staff experience and really just looking at um, all the different elements. It could be physical, it could be procedural, it could be um, a service or a system, it could be a digital touch point. Um, and then eventually from there, uh, I found my way about six or seven years ago uh, to MADPOW, uh, now leading our, our department that focuses heavily on uh, patient improvement and patient experience uh, improvement. So this had been my life for, for at least a decade. Um, and uh, within that time, uh, myself and my team have used many different tools that are out there in the field to really advocate for patients, what their experiences are like, uh, give them a voice, and help organizations uh, it, then with that knowledge and that perspective really start to improve what it is uh, to be a patient uh, in all of these different omni-channel methodologies that we could do. Lots of different uh, methods that we've used uh, both, both in the past and in the present in terms of how to capture that patient experience. Uh, and in that time, I, I've certainly visited uh, hundreds of patients in many different locations throughout the United States. Uh, and that had been for a long time uh, my focus and then starting six years ago, uh, my son was born. My son, his name is Isaac. And uh, after some struggles um, that we had with him at a very early age, uh, Isaac was diagnosed with a relatively rare uh, genetic variant, uh, a condition that has potentials for lots of different complications. Uh, and with that came uh, a new perspective, not just as a consultant who improves patient experience, but in this case, uh, a parent uh, who, of a child who now needs to interact with the healthcare system. And for, for Isaac, his interactions, his ecosystem of, of, of healthcare 
uh, has grown exponentially to many different specialists, many different fields at many different institutions uh, throughout the, the East Coast here. Um, and that has been, for me, uh, even more of an of a, uh, eye-opener uh, for, as, as, as an individual who for so long was uh, attempting to improve patient experience, now being somebody who in, in, in some shape, way, or form um, is, is powerless to do so, uh, now playing a role in the system as opposed to an, an advocate outside of it. Um, and, and for my son, this, this, this had a huge impact. I mean, uh, in, the, in the six years he's been here on this earth, he has had at least at this point 220 different uh, medical visits or medical interactions of, of all uh, types, whether it's uh, more serious to the more mundane. And, and that represented, uh, at this point, almost 10% of his waking life in some shape, way, or form interacting uh, it with the U.S. healthcare system. Um, and then my wife and I, along uh, his side the entire way, uh, as, as sometimes observers, sometimes directly interacting with this overall process. And this is really where this kind of frustration started to well up in me in, in that um, I, Within this experience, uh, as a parent, uh, I felt very powerless to, to change what was happening, um, whether it was frustrations or, or, or issues that we would have in the overall process. And what really started to, to drive me kind of crazy as a parent, not just as a consultant, was that uh, in the United States, there's, there's so much regulatory uh, support and laws already in place that are embedded to improve consumer experiences. You, you are now no longer allowed to wait for more than three hours uh, on the tarmac, uh, sitting in an airplane without huge penalties being uh, uh, invoked on that that airline, uh, specifically designed to improve, in this case, passenger experience. And the same go is, is is true for so many different elements that are out there. Whether it's um, purchasing a mortgage or um, a car, there there's elements of standardization that are in place that uh, that regulate those experiences so that people are protected. At the same time. You could easily be a patient in a waiting room waiting there for 12, 14, 16 hours uh, in, in, in an emergency department. And there's nothing out there from a regulatory standpoint that says that that's either okay or not okay. And, and, um, and, and that level of frustration certainly was something that I know m myself and my son and my wife have experienced uh, over this past six years. So one of the motivations that I um, have, have um, started to build upon and something that I uh, – really start to push and, and communicate to my clients, especially in, in the healthcare field, is that there needs to be uh, a patient experience bill of rights. There needs to be uh, a way of advocating for um, uh, unquestionable um, elements within the interacting with patients or, the, or, or how patients interact with the overall healthcare system um, that lead to uh, positive solutions or, or positive outcomes. But in, in really just a, a way of governing how decisions are, are made within institutions or how things are prioritized. So with all my healthcare projects, I always in, introduce this idea of, of introducing principles or these rights as, as an element to it. What's interesting, though, is that um, with my interactions in, in pediatric spaces is that these, these experiences or these kind of rights that, or these perspectives that we build uh, change dramatically when we introduce the element of children into the overall mix. And so we can talk about... Um, how important it is to be transparent or um, what it means to have respect, but how does that translate to um, to the perspective and to the, the mind of a child has dramatic effects on, you know, on how these solutions will actually work in the future. So that's what we're going to talk about here. We're, we're going to talk about some of these uh, potential rights that patients should have, but really translating these into uh, the, the mindset or the behaviors of children and how that variances or changes dramatically from a, a parent or an adult perspective. So let's start from, from uh, a few of these different examples. And it, it just as, as a note, I'm going to be talking about examples that are omnichannel in nature. And by that I mean they could be physical, they could be digital, it could be a service element. The images I use tend to be more physical because it's an easier thing to represent. So you may say, well, he's talking a lot about the architecture or the space or the environment. I am, but I'm also referencing um, uh, how, how individuals are interacting with each other or how the service elements or how the digital supports that as well. It just happens to be the, uh, the visuals that, that are queued up in this particular presentation. But that said, um, let's start talking about some of these rights that I think are really important, how they translate to children. And the first one is uh, around trans tra being transparent or transparency. 
and, and what we're talking about here is really just the, the, the right to be informed as to what's happening um, in any shape, way, and form. This is important for any patient that, that's out there to answer the simple question as to what's going on, uh, what's happening, um, uh, you know, it, what, is, what, what are the type of things that I should expect going forward? Um, and, and to start with a little bit of contro controversy, uh, some of the more traditional methods as to how that's done, especially from a, an adult perspective, um, tend to not work very well for children. And, and the one that I'm going to pick on here as, as the first example is uh, medical rounds. So if you're an, an a admitted patient in a hospital, uh, the, the evolved norms of today is to use uh, a situation called rounds to inform patients as to um, how things are, are going on a, on a daily basis. This is really uh, an evolution of a system that was put in place specifically to get uh, physicians and caregivers and nurses and case managers uh, all on the same page in terms of the situation of, of a patient. This, this, this started as a uh, behind closed doors type of communication in, in these group settings and eventually it was moved out into the into the hallways and into the patient rooms as a way of integrating the, the patients themselves into the process so they can hear these conversations of what physicians are saying. And uh, one of the things that, that we've observed over time is that um, these are still very oriented for the physicians and for the caregivers themselves. So the conversations that are taking place tend to be quite technical in nature. And even the environment that these conversations are happening in are, are less than ideal. This, this picture kind of uh, proves that, that a lot of these type of medical rounds take place in, 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 in loud or noisy hallways. Um, it's not exactly the greatest uh, environment to have a serious conversation or even to discuss something as serious as a, a potential prognosis uh, of or, or status of a, of a patient. Um, that's, a, that's a harsh environment to hear something that could be quite negative. So we know for a fact that about 20% of what is uh, conversed or communicated in these situations is actually absorbed by families. And, if, and, and that's families of, of adults. If we integrate uh, the actual true patient into this process, uh, those, those um, percentages of, of information that's understood goes way, way down. There are, for, for pediatrics though, um, three really kind of core things that any child is really trying to understand in terms of what's going on, right? They want to know what's happening now. So what, what are the, what's the situation that, that, I'm, that I'm in uh, so I can understand the environment around me uh, as, it, as it exists right this second, right? That's what every child is, is asking often. And then from there, what's going to happen next? So it says here what will happen later, but really just the next step. We don't need to go into um, the 12 steps down the line or what's going to happen in, in a week or so, but really just what to expect as the next thing that's going to happen to you as we interact with you as a patient. Those are the very simplified elements um, that, that any child is really asking for to reduce some of that anxiety of, of the unknown. Because what kids will do is that if they don't know what's happening next, their imaginations take over and they'll start to assume the worst or assume a potential negative. That could actually not be the, the situation that, that's in front of them, but th that fear will start to build. And then the, the most common question is, is uh, for that, what's happening next? Is, is it going to hurt? Is there a needle involved? Is, is this going to be an uncomfortable situation? They deserve to know that. Um, scaring them into the process as, as they go is certainly in, impactful. Um, and, and really what this is getting to is the fact that uh, medical rounds as a way of really providing transparency is, is not really designed in an environment that's, that's generally considered positive for, for, for pediatric patients. Um, and I'll give you uh, a, a kind of an example here. Think about it this way. As a parent, I may look at this photo of, of all these physicians uh, in their rounds interacting with this patient, and I may think, wow, look at this. All of these very talented, smart individuals are helping out my son, right? Um, it's almost like I'm getting my money's worth or I'm getting my, my, um, the, the, the smarts in the room that I need to make sure that I'm assured that the right things are happening at the right time. But from uh, this poor fellow's perspective, could you imagine waking up from a nap and uh, sitting up in bed and you're surrounded by 15 strangers all staring at you? Um, so it, as we shift perspectives here to, uh, to the actual children themselves, and in, in this case, uh, a patient waking up, in a room, it's, it's closer to akin of a horror story than it is a, a, an overall uh, positive experience to have all these strangers kind of staring at you at any one time. Uh, and, and, and this is where the whole medical round element uh, can kind of play a part. We know, for instance, that uh, up to around preteen, 
uh, children tend to have better relationships and tr have better trust with individuals. So you'll hear things like um, so-and-so has a favorite physician or a favorite nurse that they like to talk to, and they warm up to those individuals as opposed to larger groups. And so the interactions tend to be more positive, they tend to be more transparent, and they tend to be more productive uh, when we're engaging in, in smaller in, uh, groups, right? So like, like I said, like, like, like their favorite nurse or their favorite uh, doctor. So what we have seen work well is uh, medical rounds take place. They are uh, transparent in nature. They are focused on the parent first, and then only a, a select few individuals then specifically interact with um, the patients uh, in the room, not around a crowd of 15 people staring. It creates a more intimate environment that we know children are more uh, sensitive to and, and respond better to. So that's just one example of this element of transparency and how that can variate from uh, an adult to a, a pediatric uh, patient. That's just one of the major challenges. Um, the others is really communicating um, that, that or answering that question of what is going to happen next. Um, the very traditional way of doing so is uh, patient whiteboards in the room, um, literally writing down, like you may have a, a CT or an MRI scan scheduled for you in, uh, later today. That's not something that a, a child can really uh, understand the context around and what to expect there. So one thing that I've seen that's starting to, to, to be more of a trend is to go from um, traditional whiteboards in patient rooms to digital uh, whiteboards, where we then have the opportunity to vary, create variances on content and uh, communication style or, or even imagery to start to communicate um, uh, who, to, who, who is your physician, what to expect next, all those different type of elements that could supposedly or, or hopefully uh, start to answer that question as to what, what will happen next to me. A great example of a nonverbal communication, more of an experiential, Philips years ago uh, created a, uh, a waiting room toy in, for the MRI um, uh, suite that they, that they had their machines in. And this toy was a great way of communicating in a, in a nonverbal but experiential way to children uh, what they themselves were going, going to soon experience in terms of using an MRI machine. In this case, as you slide the, the toy in, uh, it activates a, a video uh, behind it that, it that starts to show that the toy being scanned. It shows that it's not scary, um, it, it doesn't hurt, and it reduces some of the anxieties. Um, and it really does answer that question as to what's going to happen next. So that happens to be one of those kind of core patient rights that I, I always advocate for uh, in terms of transparency. The other that I think is very important for uh, pediatric patients is this concept of uh, familiar or familiarity, the sense that um, uh, in general, uh, children respond very well to environments that they're uh, used to, uh, and that could be around uh, the cadence or the timing or even just the physical layout but uh, things that they uh, understand uh, they are comfortable with and will interact with far, far better. The challenge is that for, for children, a hospital environment is basically an alien spaceship, right? No one has at home uh, the type of machinery or lighting or uh, equipment or even things as, as, as simple as the, the feeling of a sheet or a pillow. All, the, all these little elements uh, compound to make things feel very, very foreign and very, very kind of, quote, alien to, to children uh, as, they, as they potentially are, are, are in these environments for the first time. Uh, and that increases anxiety levels. It, um, it makes them generally feel uh, more afraid, less receptive to, towards communication with, with uh, physicians and other individuals. Um, and it, I, I just want to uh, contrast this with, with uh, a different methodology that you'll see out there, which is... Um, as we talk about things that are familiar, there's also these principles of distraction. Those are two different um, things, right? So, so a distracting experiences or, or distracting elements, they certainly work. I'm not saying that they don't, but they, they work very temporarily. So if, if we're going to introduce a child to a space, uh, but we know that there's a simple procedure that needs to take place, maybe it's only a few minutes long, maybe a half hour or so, uh, elements of distraction do work. But when we're talking about uh, a longer-term engagement with children, whether they're inpatient or repeat patients within an environment, um, the elements of, of, of being uh, of, of, familiar, of a familiar space or familiar experience um, work in the long run. Um, not, we're not talking half hour. We're talking um, you know, days or weeks or even months within an environment or within a, uh, an overall hospital or healthcare solution. So what do they break down to? Um, 
there's elements of comfort, certainly. Um, cadence is, is extremely important. We know that children, um, uh, from a, a sense of normalcy of cadence is in, in rep repetition, or even just a, a schedule that they can keep is really important. Um, we know uh, when, when it's time to get up in the morning, when, when breakfast is gonna be, and lunch and dinner, uh, the different procedures of going to bed, brush your teeth, uh, put on your pajamas, all those different kind of uh, um, repetitive elements uh, are comforting to kids. So when we break those cycles, um, there's, there's a negative reaction potentially there. There's other elements as well that are important, uh, feeling safe in the environment that you're in, um, elements of, of, uh, of natural, and that could be uh, natural light, it could be the materials that, that um, you physically can, can see or touch. And then there's this, the, the common elements of, of being a, uh, a child and, and having uh, tactile experiences. Uh, kids want to uh, interact with the environments around them by touching things or feeling them. Um, and very often you, you'll see as, as kids walk into any kind of um, healthcare type environment, the parents go, don't touch anything. Everything's covered in germs. And that automatically is now removing one of their natural instincts as to how they in engage with the, with the environment around them. So certainly um, challenges here, but there are solutions that can kind of reinforce these elements of, of familiarity um, to, to kids. A couple of examples, again, I'm, I'm kind of picking on the environment as a way of showing so, but um, I, li I like this as an example of a, of a, of a patient room where we're, we're starting to check off a few of these different boxes, right? It doesn't feel too much like a, uh, a patient room in the sense that there isn't a whole lot of equipment um, that's out in view. Um, there is clearly natural light and natural materials that have been selected. But what I really like about this is that the, as an example of a service interaction element, the, uh, the nursing station is uh, not in the room. It's actually outside with an observation window. And what this allows to, uh, from a service perspective is that observations can be made, the nurse can, can do whatever charting or procedures that need to be be done in, in an observation mode, not a patient interacting mode, without walking in the room and interrupting that individual. So we're not breaking the cadence of sleep, which is a huge issue in terms of um, long-term uh, effects of delirium or uh, confusion. One of the fastest ways to get there is by breaking sleep cycles. So any way we can avoid that is, is hugely important. In this case, uh, observation um, sections certainly help with that process. Um, but it also, um, is, is a great way of, of not introducing, again, that kind of stranger element into the room repeatedly at, on, a, on a regular cadence. So uh, one, one facet of this idea of, of a familiar environment. The other trend that, that's out there from an architectural perspective is to um, adjust or remove a lot of the, uh, quote, medical devices or medical elements from the headboard or headwall. The headwall is traditionally the area where you would see things like uh, med gases, so um, oxygen, uh, compressed air, uh, suction lines, um, e EKG or other types of monitors, uh, drip lines, and all those different things create a um, really this this composition of you're in a medical environment, and it reinforces that over and over again as you see it. So, especially in pediatric type spaces, uh, one of the major trends now is to either uh, try to remove as many of those elements as possible, or really just to hide them within millwork. So they're all really still there, but they're behind uh, a cupboard or a board or a wall that can be easily accessible, but you're not always in this modality of intense uh, medical solutions or medical devices always in your face. So one other area that, that we're seeing in terms of a trend uh, to re reinforce this sense of a, a familiar environment. Another aspect of, of uh, familiar is uh, a feeling of being safe. Uh, you're in a, a space that you're not n normally in. Uh, that could be as, uh, as intimate as an individual patient room, but certainly in waiting rooms, emergency departments, uh, common spaces. And it's, it's interesting here because uh, security is, is a double-edged sword when it comes to children's experiences. Um, security is certainly very, very important. And from an adult perspective, um, you know, we pulled this many times. There is certainly an, an appreciation to see and know that in waiting rooms or, or in the hallways that there is this element of security and that they can feel safe in that environment. But for children, the, uh, it, it's a little bit different because they see uh, individuals that are, that are security and those security uh, staff may be actual on-duty uh, police officers or, or security staff that looks like a police officer. And they can't 
translate that context of this person is here is here to make me safe. They see potentially security as something bad has happened or something bad could happen. And it's actually a reinforcer of an anxiety trigger because they don't associate potentially um, seeing a police officer with a good situation as opposed to um, a bad situation. So this is where that, that kind of um, abstract or that, that juxtaposition between adult perspective and, and pediatric uh, perspective has a, a wild swing in it when it comes to, in this case, this perception of security. Best part about um, this, this, this notion, though, because if, if we need to ask the question of, well, what do kids feel safe or makes them feel comfortable or safe in the environment, left to their own devices, kids are fantastic at actually creating um, the situations that they themselves uh, will respond very positively to. Uh, you simply just need to give them the tools to do so, and they will, they will build, they will construct, um, and they will build uh, these environments that have all the, the elements or the features that, that for them will reinforce these uh, notions of security or safe or comfort um, or, or even it's just general, generalized familiar. And this is a great, uh, a couple of examples of, you know, you leave the kids on the couch, they'll uh, build themselves the, a nest or a fort or a pillow fort. Um, and, you, and you can say, okay, well, they did that because for them that's enjoyable and they, they like the space inside of it. Um, and what about that space then is, is important? Well, it's soft. Um, it's, it's from a scale perspective quite tight and, and enclosed, so they don't feel like they're in a very large open space. Um, it's, it's acoustically dead. It has uh, soft tactile elements to it. Uh, and then you could take those and then you could retranslate those in, as part of a patient experience and, and, and build those type of environments within a, the overall construct of a, of a space that checks the, the exact same uh, boxes. Smaller enclosed spaces, soft tactile elements to them, uh, acoustically um, dampening. And, and what, what will happen is that we're now reflecting children's own needs in terms of, of how they want their environment and, and the space can do so at the same time. So this is just, just happens to be a few examples from a, a sense of familiarity. Certainly I could go on for days just about this one topic, but I wanted to touch upon some of these other elements of, uh, of what I consider uh, patient rights. And especially when it comes to uh, pediatric patients, a, a major one is scale. And, and there's two elements of scale that we can talk about here. Uh, the first is really the, the literal sense of scale and uh, the, the entire science of human factors design or human factors engineering is a reflection of that. It's, it's really the, the elements of understanding how uh, physically a person interacts with the environment or the space or the elements around them, how they pick up a, a, a drink or uh, walk through a space or sit in a chair. Um, and, and this is actually a great example of um, when, when scale is uh, factored in, is it a hit or miss in terms of how the, in this case, the environment is responding to it? And you'll notice that uh, for adults, this is a, actually a main hallway or thoroughfare within a, a major pediatric hospital. Um, so a lot of people and a lot of children walk through the space and they've uh, tried to uh, engage the space somewhat with some um, pictures on the right-hand wall. But you'll see that the, uh, that the heights of all these are designed for humans. Uh, that are at least 15 to 16 years of old, age, if, if not older, uh, really uh, adult um, uh, height in terms of, of their mounting distance. And this is a, a pediatric hospital where the majority of the true customers uh, are under the age of 12 or so uh, and, and who couldn't really get a very good view of these, these photos. Their, their world exists um, at around three foot six and below. So one of the things I, I like to, to tell my, my clients, um, whether they're executives or, or directors within the hospitals, is that the best way to uh, experience these uh, the spaces that they're investing in or what exists today is you know, get down on the, on the actual level of, of the patients that, that would be walking through the space, whether that means uh, sitting in a wheelchair or, or something that, that literally physically gets them down to below three feet and then see, well, what does it like, look, look like now? Um, are the things like the paintings at the right heights? Um, or, or you know, other elements that really are, are ignoring um, the, the tiny humans that we're really here to, to design for. Great example of, of when you do that, you'll start to realize uh, when there's opportunity. Uh, this is an example of, of a, uh, a magic bean that's a um, kid store I designed uh, a long, long time ago, about, about 14 years ago. And when we did this, when we got down on, on the kids level, um, there are certainly major elements of, of design when it comes to um, 
presentation of toys and how signage works and uh, lighting and all those things. But one of the major challenges here uh, that is a reflection of understanding of scale is that when parents are up at the register uh, to buy uh, whatever items that have been picked, there's not much for the kids to do. And they get kind of antsy and they start to bug the parents. They want to play with the toy before it's sold. So uh, again, looking at things from uh, the, the children's angle, we realized that that, that, that front of the, the counters is, a, is an opportunity to create a diorama or really just, just a moment of distraction or, or engagement at that, um, at, that, at that little kid's perspective. It buys parents a few minutes of time, gets the transaction done, and they, and they can go. And that just happens to be um, one example of, of how uh, shifting perspective from a scale could open up opportunities in terms of how we engage with patients. So that is uh, one element of uh, perception when it comes to or, or scale. There is another element of scale, though, which is this, this idea of, of perception. And what I mean by that is, is um, depending on the age of the individual, um, the, the grandeur or the scale of the environment around them uh, starts to shift. And, I, and by that, I can say that an infant or, or a baby is really, really just focused on what they can hold in their hands. Their entire world is about a foot away from them at any one time. Um, so uh, the toy that's in their hands, the, the mom that's in front of them, that's about it. Everything beyond that is uh, difficult to see, isn't really much uh, in terms of a, a major element of their context. And so we, we can understand that and design for solutions that best fit them. And, and there's plenty of things that, that are out there in terms of bassinets and um, and toys and things that really understand that the scale is, is shifted when it comes to, to age. And why I mention this and why this is important is because the big question that I get all the time around designing for pediatric spaces is that it's, it's such a difficult challenge in that, the, in that the age range, it could be anywhere from a infant to an 18 year old. So how on earth do I design uh, uh, an overall patient experience that is generalized enough that that fits the needs of, of uh, somebody about to go to college potentially and somebody who's three years old, three years old and has just learned to walk um, without alienating one age group or over focusing on another this i this is a, a legitimate concern it is difficult to do uh, but we could use this perception scale as a tool to, to start to solve for that and as i mentioned uh, as as individuals start to grow their their their, their scale of the world around them continues to grow, right? So as I mentioned before, infants are really focused on what's uh, directly in front of them. Uh, toddlers start to look at things a little bit broader. Uh, then, we, then we're looking at uh, you know, kids between the ages of, of five and eight are more engaged with other individuals within uh, uh, the environment and other elements. And, and so that the scale of how we interact with individuals could then be targeted towards the age group. Um, I'm not making this up. It is actually a very popular method in terms of theme parks, because if you think about it, uh, any theme park has to cater to entire families that are engaging with their experiences. Um, this happens to be Harry Potter World, as, as, as one example. Um, and, and, and a very classic one where you know you could have Potter, Potter fans that are 45 years old or, or those who are just learning the, uh, to read the books for the first time and are five years old. So how do you create an environment, a experience, an engaged uh, overall process that can check boxes off and really be fulfilling to such a large age range. And they use this scale methodology as a way of, of doing so. So what we're seeing here is what is called the grand scale or the God scale, where it's the large, broader elements that the older audience is going to respond to and see um, and, and, and really experience. Um, and then from there, uh, the scale starts to shrink, right? So um, now we're talking human scale. So this is uh, slightly younger age range potentially, but it's uh, how human beings are now interacting within the space themselves individually or with the environment. And then we have the individual scale. So this is uh, more detailed and nuanced elements within the larger uh, process. It could be uh, different details. It could be shop elements. And then we get into the micro scale, which is uh, the fine details, the, the, uh, the individualized objects themselves. It, it turns out that people like to buy objects at the micro scale. So a lot of the things you'll see in theme parks that are catered towards the younger audiences happen to also be things you can buy, shops. Uh, in this case, you can buy a, um, a, a wand at one of the shops. And it really is there to, to engage the younger audiences while the older audiences are, are engaged at, at the different scales. 
now that happens just to be uh, one method that 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 works in terms of uh, of a solution. I, feel free to follow up with me. I'd be happy to talk about how some of these translate into um, healthcare spaces. I have lots of examples there as well. But for time's sake, let's just move on to uh, what I think is a really important uh, other element from a, a patient bill of rights, which is uh, respect or, or, or being or felt to be respected. And this is a very broad category, but I'm going to pick on one specific element here, which is this idea of time and to respect my time. Um, this is actually fairly near and dear to me as a father as well, especially a father with uh, an individual who has an interacted with the healthcare system so much because uh, for me, I, I always feel that every time I take my son to yet another doctor's visit or wait in yet another waiting room, that it is stealing time from my son, uh, time that could be spent outside playing uh, with his friends uh, or really just having a better, more positive experience somewhere else. And of all the commodities that exist out there in terms of um, you know value and money and, and perspective that, that exists there, time is the only one that I can't get back to him. So for me, this is uh, one of the more important uh, elements to, 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 to design for because uh, it's the hardest one um, to, 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 to lose, really. And, and in this case, for, for my son to, to lose uh, in, in small bits over the past six years or so. So when we talk about time um, and, and really respecting people in their time, I can guarantee you that the fastest way to uh, a negative uh, KPI or a complaint or a generally, uh, you know, negative start to experience. It could be a, a, a comment on an HCAP score or a Prescani score. But wasting people's time is is really the 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 trigger that gets a lot of people very, quite upset. Um, you know, and, and the very classic examples of that certainly are uh, waiting in waiting rooms uh, or, or or spending time in, in parts of a process that they know doesn't need to actually uh, be so so long. So there are two elements of, of, of time that we can talk about. One is the experience of wait, and there's an entire science around this of how do we get people to, to wait and feel like they haven't waited so long or wait in a certain element of comfort. But then I think more importantly is the notion of rem the removal of wait, um, and so that we don't even have to um, have people uh, wasting their time or in, in a positive environment. Instead, no wasting of any time at all. It's better for everybody. Um, certainly, in, in my experiences with my son, we have uh, experienced extraordinarily large amounts of, of, of waiting in, in these 220 or so different visits. Um, and, and the first thing you'll, that we tend to notice is that if we, if we step into a, a waiting room of some sort and there are a lot of elements of distraction there, it's basically saying, yeah, you're, you're going to wait a long time. And so as part of that, we're going to uh, provide some, some, you know, points of distraction to your, your child to help him uh, through what is going to be a potentially a, a long process. And I'm not saying that distraction methodology uh, doesn't work. It, it does. Sometimes we pray in, in, uh, in, some, in these waiting rooms that there's going to be a fish tank somewhere in there uh, just because we know that he likes fish and that will buy us next 15 to 20 minutes before he starts to, to get antsy um, in, in terms of a wait. But at the same time, it's, it's also kind of just a notion that um, – uh, the weight has to exist, and it's it's an element that um, can't somehow be removed. So it's almost setting the expectation that yes, you're 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 about to be uh, in here for the long haul, but we're going to help you to be distracted. And as I mentioned, distraction uh, methodology isn't a bad thing. It, it it does work. I'm actually a huge advocate for distraction as a uh, as a very short term method for engaging with patients in in, in certain situations. Um, I've actually uh, helped integrate uh, VR as a distraction technology and methodology. Um, and, um, in, in certain different medical situations like uh, phlebotomy in the uh, venipuncture process, so actually inserting the needle in a patient that happens to be the, a very high-stress situation and a few moments of uh, really engaging distraction work uh, really well to, to minimize that. Same for uh, burn units in terms of some of the, um, the wound cleaning procedures uh, that can be quite intense and painful. Um, distraction helps there as well. So I'm picking on distraction in terms of waiting experiences uh, as one element, but certainly they work in, in others. Here again is my, my son as my, uh, my test subject uh, looking to see that if we are going to go in, into uh, VR solutions, do they even physically fit on, a, on pediatric and, 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 and kids' heads? Uh, and, and you can see that the one on the right 
does, but the one on the left uh, is a system that's just simply too big and you had to hold it up a little bit. Uh, another example where uh, maybe the, the intentions are good from a, a technology perspective, but the implementation has its challenges uh, uh, in terms of scale. So let's talk a little bit about that, that waiting game. Uh, and we certainly have seen here at MAPA lots of different uh, ways that uh, the waiting experience is uh, introduced or, or supported from a, a patient perspective. Um, one of the, the, the traps that we do see though is this notion of look but don't touch in that we're gonna provide you with these cool things to uh, engage with. Uh, it could be a statue or uh, a climbing structure, a funny looking chair, um, but uh, we're going to request that the that the patient not touch or interact with the, with with the, uh, the quote presentation of what this is, and that goes against every kind of built-in behavior in nature of any child who really wants to engage with their uh, environment around them. Uh, as I mentioned, in the sense of familiarity, the, that tactile element is is quite important. So um, when when we say you know, this is a, a cool statue, but you're not allowed to climb on it, or here's a bunch of cool looking toys, but they're behind a glass case and you're not allowed to actually interact with it. That is a very anti-intuitive to a child, and it does not yield a, a positive result in terms of their, their waiting experiences. A few other kind of uh, details that we've seen kind of fall between the cracks sometimes is, for instance, um, having coloring books on tables, but without any crayons or uh, ways of engaging with uh, the, the, the material that that's there. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of um, uh, potential uh, areas of improvement that we've seen throughout the, the, just the general kind of healthcare industry when it comes to the, the waiting experience and, and how to buy time. You'll, you'll find that, that this is not just a, a moment of anxiety for children, but certainly a, uh, an element of anxiety for, for parents as well. They tend to be just as, as nervous in terms of, will we survive the next hour and a half in this wait without there being a meltdown? What will happen if that in that, in that situation if, if it does. So it is, it is an area of certain focus. Now let's talk, talk a little bit about, about the other side of, of waiting, which is negating waiting, um, or, or at least trying to reduce some of that. So we're, we're, we really are respecting people's time. This is an image of a, of a nurse who has uh, handed to a patient uh, as part of the registration a form that they had to fill out. Uh, that patient is now in a waiting room um, uh, waiting for this nurse to go back to her, her desk where she's going to now manually type in all that information onto the system. And then from there, eventually it'll be notified to the physician that this patient's ready to be seen. And so what we've done is we've added steps to a process and really forced a, a waiting experience to, to a patient. And, we, and we've seen this happen over and over again um, in terms of a lack of efficiency in simple things like registration. You'll see that, that there are trends uh, moving forward now where uh, we try to remove that uh, manual step of, of data entry where uh, patients are handed a laptop or a tablet or some sort of device where the information that they input is then transferred directly into a system. And I'm not saying that that's, not, that, that's a bad thing. It's, it's great. It's actually uh, proven to reduce potential wait times. But the, the ideal is to actually even negate that and to pre-register or or you know, collect data that's already in systems or, or do something where when you're walking into an overall experience, um, you're ready to go. And we're, in there in, we're not then saying, okay, now that you're here, it's time to, to really register or set up the overall process. It's, uh, it's an expectation that is being built into a lot of other uh, analogous experiences out there. So it's, it's an area that we see as a major trend going forward. And I just have a few minutes left here before uh, we break for some questions. The last element that I think is really important from a, a pediatric uh, bill of rights is around this element of joy or this notion of uh, really introducing elements of, of, of positive thinking or positive experience into the process. I know that healthcare is uh, a, situ a serious situation and if any child is, is an admitted patient in a, in a, um, in a room or, or in any hospital that they're there for a reason. Um, but one thing that I always advocate for is that they don't need to be reminded on a daily or hourly basis as to how serious their situation is. What they do need is moments to feel like a kid again, uh, to have areas of feeling happy and, uh, and, and joy or, or even just feeling normal for a few minutes is, is really, really important. Um, it, it, one of the things that, that was such a huge success that I did see uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital walking the halls was this uh, little 
uh, dyed pink poodle that was walking around. Uh, it was absolutely um, uh, mauled by so many different kids as, as a great way of just really distracting them just for a few minutes from um, what their experiences is. This happens to be one of many ways of introducing some fun or joy into an overall process. I'm not saying that we have to you know, throw dogs into every experience, but it happens to certainly work. And I, I've seen it happen uh, many different times. This happens to be in, in Atlanta in their radiology suite. There's actually a, uh, a radiology dog that can greet um, patients as they walk in for a, a, a scan. And that really does reduce the anxiety and. Uh, is a nice surprise that doesn't introduce that element of joy. It's not all about dogs, though. Um, every day you'll see articles or um, or different stories that are kind of heartwarming out there of all these different pediatric um, uh, institutions that are attempting in their own ways to introduce um, a little bit of happiness or a little bit of uh, positivity into what would otherwise be a serious situation. This is just uh, from I, – I actually pulled this from today. You, you, can, you can literally find these on a daily basis. This is from um, – yesterday's paper at the, on the Sunday Post in uh, Glasgow, uh, featuring a few different physicians who um, decided to dress up as clowns moving forward on their daily basis so that they become the quote clown doctors uh, that are very much well received with their, with their child patients. So all that said as a recap, um, I know we're just about out of time here. Um, the, the major ways that we start to discover what's really important here is that um, the, the real big focus is, is about behavior over demographics, and, and, and by that I mean to really understand the, the nature and the understanding and the instincts and the motivations of, of patients themselves, in this case of pediatric patients, which is different than, from adults. And then knowing that is a great way of then reflecting how different solutions could work for them. It's really uh, uh, the core of human-centric design that we do here at MADPOW. Uh, understanding the context that they find themselves in, for sure. So. Um, uh, Kids on the playground are certainly not going to be behaving the same way as kids in a admitted into a, a, a patient room or a step-down ward or uh, ICU. Um, so we know that there are variances when it comes to the situation, but that context is really important to design towards. Uh, and, and really follow the story. And I think that's the, the most important part uh, for me anyway. I, I've had the opportunity to follow my son's story and his navigation of the healthcare system for six years. And even as being a consultant in this space for the past uh, 15 years, it, it's been a really eye-opening experience to figure out and, and, to, and to see how, uh, how he interacts and what makes things either a positive or negative for him um, and, and, uh, or, or even just children in general. Um, there's, there's always room for improvement and room to kind of gain that perspective. So um, gathering that story, that perspective of patients is, is a huge element of, of what we do here and, and a, a major motivation as to how we make changes. So um, it is uh, 12.48, and we have a few minutes available for questions, if anybody has any questions they'd like to, to ask. So thanks, Jonathan. That was terrific. Um, I learned a lot. It's the first time I've heard you speak on this topic. So um, there are some questions coming in. So again, people, if you put them in the question area, we'll go through them one by one. Um, so let me start off with one, and it said, are there any publications or web resources that have more information, and can they share this with their recording with their colleagues? So I'll answer the second part first. We are recording this. We'll be sending it out to everybody who registered, and we'll also be posting it on our website, so you can absolutely share it. But Jonathan, do you have any recommendations of um, publications or web resources? Yeah, so uh, there are a few out there that, that are great. Uh, one that I'm always an advocate for is uh, the Pebble Group, which is um, part of an organization that really focuses on making sure that uh, institutions that are implementing these major changes to improving patient experience don't make the same mistake twice. So it is a sharing of both case study and recommendations from the, the, the actual architects, the directors, the uh, IT folks, um, the, the project managers um, of what they've learned themselves works in the field, and then how to then repeat that moving forward. Um, so I, I'd be happy to share that and a few other links that, that, that are great resources uh, as online tools. Um, so another question is, do you face any hurdles in having clients implement these solutions or implement them quickly? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, the biggest challenge is that they, is that they're, they tend to be cross-departmental. So if we're talking about patients that are 
walking into uh, a facility for the first time or in a potentially navigating to a specific department after maybe um, having frustrations finding parking, you'll notice that there are, all, you'll quickly notice that there are a lot of elements that have no kind of quote ownership. And, um, and so, the, so to make changes to those is very difficult. Whereas if, if I said that there's a procedural uh, or a communication change that needs to take place in a, you know, a cardiology department as to how they're introducing a certain procedure, that's quite easy, or not easy, but easier uh, to make that change happen. What tends to be missing are experience owners. And so one of the, the kind of organiza organizational design elements we, we tend to uh, suggest or, or, bring, or bring about is this notion of uh, having uh, directors or, or individuals uh, who are responsible for both advocating and maintaining the quality of uh, experience scenarios that are outside of the traditional departments of a hospital. And so an experience scenario could be something like uh, first time arrival, or it could even be as nuanced as finding parking or a follow up. Um, and, and this is where we start to fill those gaps of um, uh, that, that are very common where a lot of these uh, negative solutions or, or, or negative um, impacts are taking place where there are potential for positive solutions, but it needs someone there to advocate for it. So that's, that's one area that um, tends to lend itself to a faster implementation is when you have that, that uh, person in charge that can then advocate for it. I've seen lots of examples, and a, and a few of my colleagues um, uh, actually focus on this from uh, an organ organizational uh, perspective in terms of how internal organizations collaborate and, and discuss and facilitate change in design. Um, so there are different models that, that, of, of implementation that take place. Um, a few are around even creating these, um, these fast-acting consortiums that have been empowered by the executive suite, the CEO, to make fast changes. And so they, they themselves may be uh, these, these kind of ragtag teams of um, physicians or operators or technicians. It could be facilities and IT. Uh, but they get together as, as their own institution, their own organization. And then from there, they have the, the carte blanche to make fast changes, um, change that, that, uh, that email that, that's being sent out, adjust that, the, the way that waiting room is being laid out, uh, change how we're introducing this certain uh, patient to this, this uh, new, new department, right? And so, and so that becomes a potential way as well. That's really just the tip of the iceberg, though. There are so many different uh, methodologies that are out there to, um, to get these changes out there faster. I have two more questions. I'll do the shorter one first. So have you seen good examples of how hospitals can quickly get to know individual children, such as all about me sections of whiteboards in the EMR, et cetera? Yeah, that's actually great because um, th this, uh, this kind of uh, notion of quickly connecting with a, um, with a patient and, and knowing, but even things like, um, what their favorite sport team is, or their favorite color, um, you know, what what their favorite TV show is, the, those are are elements of the dialogue that then can be uh, implanted into the interactions uh, that a physician or a caregiver can can then have with that that patient. Uh, I, I've even seen things go go as far as you know, uh, a certain physician knew that my son was really into robots, so. When they came, when he came for one of his uh, regular visits, they had waiting for him uh, a very large assortment of robot stickers, which he completely lost his mind about. Thought it was the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread. Really improved that that day for him. Um, and and for them, that was something that that was off the cuff, and it was because we had at this point been there about 30 different times. But um, I have seen variances to uh, registration in patient information systems, even elements that are added to uh, e EHRs that have a, uh, a profile that introduces some of those things in it. So it could even say things like, uh, this person loves the color blue, or their favorite thing are clowns, or they hate clowns, or, or whatever it ends up being. And that really is just a, a little bit of extra information that um, it, it would be important at, from, a, from a service perspective to integrate. And if you look at um, client retention model systems uh, outside of healthcare, um, they all do this. They all collect or try to collect some of those patterns of behavior or those preferences so that it becomes very important fodder for the actual service provider to engage with that, that individual, reflecting that they know the, the likes, the objectives, the needs, the passions of that, that individual. 
that's certainly something that, that, that can and has been done in, in healthcare environments. All right, I have a um, question that is going to take a little bit of reading, uh, but I think it's really interesting. So hold on there. So okay. how do you suggest integrating the age of the child into the Bill of Rights? For example, how do you ensure it applies to non-pediatric practitioners that a child might have to see, um, such as a child that might have to see a retina specialist who is used to dealing with much older patients? So the first oh, part again, okay. yeah, so again, it's like implementing, integrating the age of the child into the Bill of Rights and how do you help with young children going to the clinicians who are not used to dealing with young children? Yeah, it's, it's it's funny, um, as, a, as a parent, uh, and I've seen this many different times, you can instantly pick out the physicians who do not normally see pediatric patients. Um, the, 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 the tone, the dialogue is so monumentally different. Um, and I, I would say that I wouldn't want to suggest that there are, are systemic crutches to support that from a, an object or a digital system or a procedural that would support uh, that. Instead, I mean, I've interviewed so many different uh, physicians and, and they've all said the same thing. It's that communicating to the patient or to the family takes up by far the most amount of time uh, that they have in terms of, of, of engaging with patients themselves. It's, it's this idea of conveying knowledge or information or this dialogue. Um, and those who really focus on that element um, in, in, in acknowledging that, that from a pediatric, pediatric perspective, it's, it's vastly different, the outcomes of that particular interaction are always or generally always better. And that's a very roundabout way of saying those who can speak well um, uh, to those situations or, or just have a certain candor or demeanor to kids, um, the, 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 the the parents, the kids, they walk out of those situations a little bit more uh, feeling better about, the, about what just happened. And, and, they, and they know it. There's a gut feel of those who maybe have, who are maybe a younger physician who's, who's, who doesn't have kids themselves um, and, and you know, doesn't really have a whole lot of experience interacting with them. I will say that there, there is a, uh, an interesting aspect of this that we see in find a doctor or find a physician tools. And, one, and, and there are all sorts of different design elements that are, are important to put in there. Uh, people connect with the, uh, the photo or image of, uh, of the person that they're going to eventually uh, interact with as a, as a physician. But one of the major elements that uh, pediatric patients uh, and their families look for uh, in terms of, of potential information in that find a doctor feature is, does this physician have kids themselves? And it, and it has no reflection on the uh, the professionalism or the expertise of that individual, but it does ensure or guarantee, potentially guarantee that that person will have a certain demeanor or certain method of interacting that will probably come off a little bit lighter or more successful for for their 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 child themselves. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so we will be sending out um, an email after this with the recording. Uh, with the list to the um, resources that Jonathan mentioned, and you'll be able to reply to that. So if you guys have any more questions, um, we'll make it easy for you to contact us. Could you go to the next slide, Jonathan? So thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad you took an hour out of your day to um, listen to Jonathan talk about patient voices and especially the pediatric patient experience. So just to let you know, we are here to help you. So we have multiple offerings here at MADPOW in the Center for Health Experience Design. So we can really help you achieve your design and innovation goals. Such as example, we offer research and strategy for anything in healthcare, finances, design, and not just pediatrics, but a whole range of experience in healthcare. User experience design and development, service design, innovation design and evaluation, and design and innovation challenges. Again, my email address is here, but you should be getting an email hopefully later today or early tomorrow with the recording and additional information. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And again, thank you so much for our your time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.